Thanks, Damir. Well, and thanks for the opportunity of uh, speaking here, of course. So as you can see, this is joint work with Dag Norman, who ironically gave a talk yesterday in the Oslo Logic Seminar. But uh, yeah, that was at 10 a.m. And that was like at 4 a.m. your time. So in a nutshell, this talk, I would like to sort of yeah, sketch reverse math, RM, and especially with an eye on philosophical and foundational questions. I will present some results that are joint work with Dag Norman, and I will try to convince you of the philosophical and foundational relevance of what we've been doing. Uh, so yeah, don't harass my collaborators. Any opinion expressed here is my own. So, well, my title contains the words Plato, Brouwer and classification. So let's start with classification. The aim of reverse math is in fact classification, namely to find the minimal axioms necessary for proving a theorem of ordinary math. Rather than starting to define many, many logical systems, I would like to start with some questions. Some conceptual questions such as, yeah, what do you mean by ordinary math? I mean, sure, math, we are all mathematicians here or some of us at least, but what's ordinary math? And while well, you say minimal, sure, but what scale does minimal refer to and why? I mean, why did people choose that scale and not another one? Third, you say the minimal axioms, but why would there always be minimal axioms that are unique and ambiguous for proving a given theorem of ordinary math? Uh, so for the first part, which is titled hubris, of course, um, I don't always wish to introduce too many systems, but I just want to point out that if you classify things according to logical strength, there are three major classes, as you may expect, weak, medium, and strong, strong being mostly where set theory lives, and this is called the Gödel hierarchy. Uh, so yeah, this is the only three classes we need for now, weak, medium, and strong. And reverse math generally takes place in the weak part and the lower end of the medium part. And it uses the language L2 of second order arithmetic Z2. Now this language is rather frugal. It contains only first and second order variables. So natural numbers and sets of natural numbers higher order objects such as functions on the real numbers or topologies are then represented or coded. Now, this is normal. If you are going to formalize math, you are going to use some kind of representation or code or coding. So there's nothing per se wrong with representing or coding math. But of course, one can always ask the question, yeah, how good is your coding, how faithful, how close to the original, and so on. So yeah, that's the language that reverse math uses. And uh, yeah, let's dive right in with question number one. What is ordinary math? So I should perhaps say, so Steve Simpson has written a book about reverse math, subsystems of second order arithmetic. And this is uh, the Bible or perhaps the Old Testament of reverse math in which he describes ordinary math as follows. That body of math prior to or independent of yeah, abstract set theory. Now, not just any math, you shouldn't modify theorems. In page 32, Steve says, well, you know, there's, there's these constructivists and it's all fine and good and dandy, but that's not what we do. Constructive math is about making math constructive. So they just add hypothesis or extra data. That's not what we do in reverse math. We like to analyze theorems as they stand. That's yeah. the message. Ordinary math is nah, no abstract set theory, but you shouldn't modify theorems. Don't cheat. You have to analyze theorems as they stand. Now, the final sentence is unfortunately a little bit paradoxical. 
uh, I usually would make a joke here about people having been to school in first world countries knowing the definition of epsilon delta continuity, but perhaps that's not so appropriate today. At any rate, all here shall know epsilon delta continuity. For all epsilon, there's a delta and so on. Now this is of course a for a function f from reals to reals. So this is a third order object and it has to be somehow represented in second order arithmetic. And that's how you do it, continuity via codes. And you don't have to take this in. My point is just that this is epsilon delta continuity and this is, well, yeah, what is this? I mean, show this to any mathematician who doesn't know logic and he'll be all or he or she will be all, what? My point is that you can't find any mainstream math textbook that uses this definition. It's a thing from yeah, recursion theory, I guess. And I mean, that's fine, but there's a bigger problem. Kulombach has shown that if you use this function, if you use this definition, actually what you build in is a modulus of continuity. So a function delta, a function that computes this delta in terms of epsilon and x, so that's a modulus of continuity. And this is the archetype of extra data as they use it in constructive math. So, but yeah, on the previous slide, we had Steve Simpson pontificating, we analyze theorems as they stand. So yeah, this is bad. So yeah, Kohlenbach points out a problem there. This definition is actually a constructive math definition, extra data and so on. So yeah, why should that still count as ordinary math and theorems formulated as such? Why should they count as ordinary math? All right. Uh, luckily, thanks to Dach Norman and Kulombach himself, he actually showed that these two definitions are equivalent in a weak system that essentially only involves weak Koenig's lemma. And this is one of those big five systems, which I will return to later. And so this is great because we know that these two definitions are the same in WKL, but that's a weak system. Nobody has any problems there. So actually using codes or epsilon delta continuity should yield the same theorems as long as we have WKL available. Problem solved, coding continuous functions is fine. But of course, some people who are not constructivists might say, yeah, but there are also discontinuous functions. And actually they're pretty old. So around 1850, Riemann, Bernhard Riemann, in, in his Habilstrift, he introduced, of course, his integral, the Riemann integral, and he essentially forced discontinuous functions into the mainstream of mathematics. Now, there's historians who write books about this, so please accept this as a truth for once. And later, Arzela even proved the convergence theorem for the Riemann integral. So yeah, so if we have a sequence of Riemann integrable functions and they should be uniformly bounded. So, so there's some upper bound for all Fn and the limit is also Riemann integral. So that's important. Then we can exchange limit and integral. Of course, this works much better for the Lebesgue integral because the Lebesgue integral, you don't need condition number three. Uh, so yeah, but nonetheless, I mean, Arzela proved this. Uh, this is all ordinary math, seriously. This predates uh, set theory. Actually, this was all, something like this was already done uh, implicitly by Denis in 1870. And well, we can analyze this in reverse math we can introduce codes. And then if we introduce codes, this theorem falls in the weak range. It's actually provable from WWKL, weak, weak Koenig's lemma. And actually oh, you can, WWKL suffices to prove something like this for the Lebesgue integral, I think even. Sure, why not? It's weak until it isn't. If you formulate this without codes, then it doesn't fall in the weak range, but it's at the very top of the medium range, near full second order arithmetic and far beyond the usual range of reverse math. And yeah, this is bad because as I said, ah, uh, yeah, you can, Dach Norman and I have put this on the archive. 
and maybe one day some journal might take our paper even. Uh, but so the point is that this is bad because yeah, Steve Simpson said, well, we should analyze theorems of ordinary math as they stand. Yeah, this is like Riemann integration. This is like so ordinary, you can't believe it. But if you formulate it without codes, it's weak. If you formulate it without codes, it's near full second order arithmetic. So yeah, coding is a bad idea here. Suggesting the following intermediate conclusion. If you really are serious about this, analyzing mathematical theories as they stand, you can have your continuous functions. Sure, it's fine. And you can code them, it's okay. This was shown by Norman and Kohlenbach. But as soon as you step outside of the continuous a little bit, so if you go to Riemann integrable functions, which are continuous AE M bounded, yeah, then basic theorems like the Arzela convergence theorem have very different logical strengths. So yeah, you can live in your continuous world with your codes, that's fine, but don't you step out of it because even basic theorems like the Arzela convergence theorem are very different when formulated with codes or not. And so this is the best result on coding yet, I would think. I'm mean, showing that coding is a bad idea. So please, can we all move along? And well, let's move on. And actually, luckily, Ulrich Kulmach had the foresight to introduce higher order reverse math. If we wish to properly study discontinuous functions, there's that. It involves all finite types. The language L omega, in fact, it has variables for natural numbers, functions, functions from bare space to the naturals, functions from reals to reals, and these can all be discontinuous. Functions, that are operators that map functions from reals to reals to the reals, and so on. Any finite type, so anything that can be caught in V omega, as it were. Um, this is nice, and, and Kuhlenbach, this is actually quite impressive, the work he has done. But it's not a full answer, as we will see now. So question number three was, are the minimal axioms always unique? For this, we shall take a look at something most analysts here will know. Uh, Terence Tao and uh, others like Gowers, they have stressed the intimate connection between compactness and local global principles. And Pinkerle, Salvatore Pinkerle already considered the following local, local global principle in 85 of 200 years ago. Uh, well, no, uh, not so, uh, more than 100 years ago. A locally bounded function on say Cantor space is bounded. Locally bounded means there's a ball around any point in which the function is bounded above. And yeah, I mean, this is a trivial application of compactness, obviously, and Pinkerle stresses that he wants to talk about any function. So he says, look, uh, Denis and, and others, they have done similar stuff for continuous functions. This is any function. And yeah, as I said, Riemann had introduced discontinuous functions into the mainstream following the study of the Fourier everything. Now, and if we assume countable choice, a fragment of countable choice not provable in ZF, then we have what you expect. Pinkerle's theorem is equivalent to WKL. WKL expresses the compactness of, countable compactness of Cantor space. And Pinkerle's theorem is a local global principle. Assuming a fragment of countable choice, not provable in ZF, these two are equivalent. All is well, tau is right. And yeah, it's in the weak range. If you don't have countable choice, this theorem actually cannot be proved in the medium range of comprehension, but it's still provable without the axiom of choice. So yeah, here we have an example. Is there a unique set of minimal axioms? No, it depends on set theoretic considerations, namely, do we have countable choice, which we have a rather weak fragment of countable choice, not available in ZF. If that is available, then we have a weak principle, it's all good. 
If we don't have countable choice, boom, it goes up to the top of the medium range, actually near full second order arithmetic. So yeah, the minimal axioms don't necessarily exist. Exist and yeah, we're here we're working in yeah, third order arithmetic, of course, essentially Kolombach's higher order reverse math. And yeah, this, this is bad, right? I mean, seriously, like countable choice, somehow ordinary math. Uh, the classification depends on the axiom of choice. All right. And this is just one example. Open says give rise to many examples. So in second order reverse math, a this is an open set. An open set is given as a union of basic open balls or equivalently a continuous characteristic function given by the kind of codes that I mentioned earlier. Right? Why not? I mean, sure. Of course, uh, following Alexander Kreutzer and others, Dach and I have looked, when I say we, it's usually Dach and I, by the way. Dach and I have studied open sets via third order, possibly discontinuous characteristic functions because, well, we've seen that only the continuous world can be faithfully represented in second order arithmetic. So yeah, let's look at the third order world and yeah, let's allow discontinuous characteristic functions. Then a number of household names from reverse math behave in the same way as Pinkerle's theorem. So these are all normal theorems, Udison lemma, oh, there's, there's a lot more actually. And in the same way means if you have countable choice, they behave as we are used to from reverse math. They're well behaved. They're not strange or weird. If you omit countable choice, then boom, all of a sudden you need full second order arithmetic to prove this. Or I mean, they're not uh, weak anymore. They live at the top of the medium range of the girl hierarchy. Uh, yeah, so yeah, I mean, let's have a, a intermediate conclusion number two. Uh, coding, if you go to Riemann integrable functions, coding can change the logical strength of theorems. We've seen this for Arzela's convergence theorem, and it can change it quite dramatically. This is unacceptable from the point of view of reverse math. So yeah, no more coding. Let's all go to Ulrich Kolenbach's higher order reverse math. However, there's then we encounter other problems like with countable choice, as I mentioned. And yeah, so this is the hubris that Norman and I undertook. We dare to show that, or we dare to imply that everything seems to be wrong with the reverse math. People don't like this. People get verbally abusive. I can name names, but I won't. Luckily, there's also catharsis. In the last year or so, it was all catharsis. Everything is actually all right with reverse math. And in the remaining part, I will show you that the answer to question two shows that all problems go away. Well, not all the world's problems, of course, that would be too easy, but at least the problems with reverse math. Question number two was the following. If the aim of reverse math is to find the minimal axioms, now well, I mean, what, what minimal axioms? What scale do you refer to? And why did people cho choose that scale? Uh, yeah, we'll see. Uh, I'll answer question two now. So this is the scale I've been talking about with the weak, medium, and strong range. Strong referring to set theory mostly. This is called the Gödel hierarchy, and many smart people have said that, well, this is the foundation of mathematics. If you're talking about something that's natural, foundational, not artificial, it's somewhere here. It's linearly ordered by consistency strength, weak, medium, strong again. And yeah, you know, significant. Uh, at least for the part we're interested in, the weak to medium range, this is a comprehension hierarchy. More or less sets exist, depending whether you go up or down. So for sets, I never know whether I should say fewer or less sets, but anyway. So for example, here we have uh, recursive comprehension. So we only have comprehension for things that are decidable. 
arithmetical formulas, pi 1, 1 formulas, and so on. So, well, I mean, there's intermediate systems, of course, like WKL and ETR0. And uh, you know ZFC, the foundations of mathematics. Second order arithmetic came to be inspired by the Grundlagen, Robert Bernays. ETR0 is the limit of Russell Weil Pfefferman predicative math. And here we have the big five of reverse math. So yeah, RC0 is sort of the base theory. It's always assumed you can do computable stuff. And the other four are, yeah, say that something non-computable exists, like AC0, the Turing jump exists, of course, pi 1, 1 comprehension, the hyper jump. And the big five are sort of, yeah, it's generally claimed that most of theorems from reverse math fall into the big five. There's exceptions. There's some good exceptions even. And yeah, a PRA is of course Hilbert's finite theorem math, but we'll not discuss that today. Natural and important systems form the linear girl hierarchy. And uh, Steve Simpson has said in print, in fact, in the latest Kurt-Schutte volume that 80 to 90% of ordinary math is provable in these systems. And you actually get a lot of equivalences. As we will see, Reality is a little bit more complicated. For some history, ye Yanks shall have it. So in the Grundlagen, Hilbert and Bernays formalize a lot of math in a logical system H. And system H is second order arithmetic beefed up with third order parameters. Uh, previous systems together with Ackermann contained like fourth and fifth order, but yeah, H is second order plus third order parameters. And then people in, inspired by that, people said, yeah, let's let's define, I guess Kreisel, let's define comprehension. So for any formula in L2, there's a set that yeah, contains, uh, set X that contains exactly the element N that satisfies phi of N. For example, uh, in, System H by Ilbert Bernays, they introduce uh, Pfefferman's mu by that name. So it's actually Hilbert Bernays's mu. And mu takes as input some f. If f has a zero, then mu of f finds you that zero. And of course, yeah, here we have a arithmetical quantifier and here we don't. And these two are of course equivalent. So this is uh, here, this way you can write down arithmetical comprehension as an AC zero. So AC0 is when you restrict this and induction to arithmetical formulas. Uh, Hilbert and Bernays also introduced the new functional. If you have a witness, if you have a function quantifier, new will compute a witness. And of course, this allows you to remove all set quantifiers or function quantifiers, and so you get full second order arithmetic because yeah, any formula becomes quantifier free. So that's what they did. Uh, Hilbert and Bernays also introduced other systems, K and L, and K still involves uh, Pfefferman's mu and L they just sketch at most. So yeah, second order arithmetic is actually the end station and so Pfefferman, Sieg, but also Suslin and Kolombach have introduced or sketched Z2 little omega. So instead of having everything second order and sets, there is this new K, which for every pi 1K formula finds a witness to uh, a function quantifier. So for, for A is a pi 1K uh, formula, and this is for all K. And yeah, that's another way of writing down comprehension because yeah, you can remove any function quantifier. And Kleene's E3 can actually do that in one fell swoop. You allow third order parameters, in fact. Uh, yeah, and so E is fourth order and it knows about these kind of zeros. So all these three have the same function you have second order quantifiers 
and you can remove them either by new k plus one by using sets or by e please e and in fact they are all the same up to uh, l2 provability so they prove the same formula same sentences of second order arithmetic so this one actually came first in Hilbert and Bernays' world. And yeah, then they would got adulterated a little bit, introducing the arithmetical hierarchy. And then presumably Kreisel yeah, introduced that. Note that Z2 little omega involves third order objects. This is called third order comprehension. And E is fourth order. So yeah, E, uh, this is fourth order comprehension. And so this is a little bit of history of comprehension. And why am I telling you this? Uh, yeah, because of the following. So remember, all these systems prove the same second order sentences. And here we have a bunch of third order theorems provable in Z2 big omega, in particular without the axiom of choice, because here's no choice. And Z2 omega cannot prove them. For example, this Arzelas convergence theorem. So I was saying it's at the top of the medium range. And now you know why, because Z2 big omega does prove it, but Z2 little omega cannot. And Arzelas convergence theorem is third order and Z2 little omega is essentially third order comprehension because it has third order comprehension functions. Two, you might call the foundation of reverse math. If you have a metric space, say the unit interval with a metric and it's countably compact, then it's separable. Yeah, this, you, know, you can't prove this easily. This lives at the top of the medium range. If you interpret open sets as third order characteristic functions, the bare category theorem suffers the same fate. Yeah, there's a function that is not in Berg class two, the bare characterization theorem, Heine Borel, Vitali, Lindelöf, any covering theorem for uncountable coverings. Yeah, the most basic Lebesgue or gauge integral. Ah, Moore. So E.H. Moore was the first head of the department of Chicago math. And he was interested in the sort of crazy questions like, What's an unordered sum? What's a sum like this? Well, it must be countable, meaning this f must be zero at all but countable, for all but a countable x. Now, this may sound crazy, but he this, this gave rise to his theory of limits together with his student Smith. And so, yeah, convergence theorem for nets indexed by bare space, they're also provable in Z2 big omega, not provable in Z2 little omega. And the uncountability of the reals, that there is no injection or bijection from the unit interval to n. This is a third order statement for every mapping from the unit interval to n. I mean, we could use Cantor space here, right? I mean, we don't need the reals somehow. The accountability of the reals, I mean, most people would believe in that, but somehow it's hard to prove. Z2 little omega cannot prove it. Z2 big omega can. It's a third order statement. This third order comprehension can't do it and the same holds for essentially any theorem from reverse math if you replace countable if it says countable in there replace countable by the actual third order definition of countable uh yeah so that's why i said incomprehensible this is bad and uh let's go into some details here so Cantor proved in 1874 the first set theory paper if we have a sequence of reals, there's another real that is not in that sequence. And then he mentions, you know, um, for this reason, the reals and the natural numbers are therefore not one to one. And he actually downplayed this fact. He was obsessed by this sort of thing, but he downplayed it because yeah, Kronecker was very anti-infinity. Weierstrass was a little bit too. And so he just mentions this. And yeah, this is well known. Uh, we can compute this. There's a computer program that computes this y from this sequence in an efficient way. This is provable in RCA zero, by the way. So it's an obvious question. What about the real uncountability? Like uh, Kunin talks about countability and uncountability in terms of injection. So yeah, how hard is it to show that there's no injection from the unit interval to the natural numbers? 
And in their book on set theory, Erbacek and Yech, uh, they say, well, yeah, we should look at bijection. So how hard is it to prove that there's no bijection from the unit interval to N? So this principle is called NIN. This principle is called NBI. And yeah, if it's provable in Z to big omega, but not provable in Z to little omega. So in terms of comprehension, it lives at the level of second order arithmetic. And this is actually the weakest principle. And yeah, it's, it's super cool. The uncountability of the reals, not provable in second order arithmetic. And this has some nice consequences because yeah, this if C2 is consistent, this system is consistent. C2 little omega plus not MBI proves second order arithmetic as you know it. And in this system, uh, there's a bijection from the unit interval to N. So there's a first real X that maps to zero. There's a second real Y that maps to one and so on. You can't put them in a sequence of course, but that's not the point. There's a first real, there's a second real and so on. So following John Stilwell, we would call the reals a potential infinity here, but you can still just develop second order reverse math as usual. So honestly, seriously, how dare you call second order arithmetic ordinary math or capturing ordinary math. If the reals can be a potential infinity, that would, most mathematicians would say, now that's crazy, that's nuts, that's not real. The reals are uncountable, you know, and they're definitely not a potential infinity. So it is consistent with the entire development of second order reverse math that the reals are a potential infinity. This would count as extraordinary math. And I mean, I've argued, I hope convincingly that we should go into the higher order realm. Here you have another argument. If you stick to second order reverse math, then you might as well have the reals as a potential infinity. And that is not ordinary math. That's crazy. All right. And here's another nice tidbit. As many of you may know, Borel and others, they didn't like the axiom of choice when it was first introduced. But ironically, many of their earlier work actually made essential but implicit use of the axiom of choice. And the same is true for Weierstrass. Around 74, I think, Weierstrass is on record rejected the idea that can be different sizes of infinity. Like infinity is infinity. There's no real difference in size. But many of Weierstrass's earlier theorems actually imply NIN or NBI so that there is no injection or bijection from R to N. So yeah, now what is great is that Weierstrass actually changed his mind. He read some of Cantor's work and then he wrote to Mittag Leffler saying, yeah, I've, I, I've previously said the opposite. But now I do believe that there's different kinds of infinity. So why does could change his mind in light of new evidence? Isn't that wonderful? So Steve Simpson uh, asks or laments in the introduction of subsystem second order arithmetic, like, yeah, you know, mathematicians, even top mathematicians like Hilbert used to be, uh, they used to work on the foundations of math, but that has changed. Well, perhaps if we would change our mind in the foundations of math every once in a while, it might attract interested people. All right, now, if you look at uh, subsystem of second order arithmetic and you do a search, the word countable is there 100 times at least. The same for the follow-up book, Reverse Math 2001. And the same is true for Dennis Hirschfeld's book, Slicing the Truth about the reverse math zoo. Of course, countable means given by a sequence because yeah, you can't really express the real definition. Like, I mean, there's an injection or a bijection to N. Now, what happens if we use the real third order definition of countable? And yeah, then we have the following. I mean, I'm gonna go for injection for now. So a countable subset of the unit interval has a supremum. So a countable subset is just something you inject into N. Uh, a collection, a countable collection of basic open intervals that covers the unit interval has a finite subcover. Again, uh, this is just Heine-Borel for countable collections of intervals instead of sequences. 
And that makes it provable in Z2 big omega, but not provable in Z2 little omega. And Borel is in red here because Borel actually formulates it this way. He does not say a sequence of basic open interval. He says a countable collection. Remember in port one, Simpson pontificating, we should analyze theorems as they stand. And with Borel, it stands as such a countable collection. And look what happens. Uh, yeah, Vitali's covering theorem for countable collections, of course. Vitali always talked about collections and sets, so because yeah, set theory a little. A countable set in the reals has finite measure. This is a most trivial fact, yet yeah, you can't prove it easily if you use the third order definition of countable. And presumably everything else in reverse math that mentions the word countable explicitly. Uh, we have a nice fact here, by the way. Uh, A is quite explosive. If you combine pi 1, 1 comprehension, omega, as given by this, this new one I mentioned, or the Suslin functional, if you combine that with item A, so the Bolzano of Iastras theorem, you can go from pi 1, 1 comprehension to pi 1, 2 comprehension. And you know, Michael Rachin said pi 1, 2 comprehension actually dwarfs pi 1, 1 comprehension. And this is sort of the outer limit of reverse math. Usually to get there, you need topology, theorems of topology. But here, look, a very simple statement, bolzano uh, Yeah, and combine that with Suslin, pi 1, 1 comprehension, and boom, pi 1, 2 comprehension. Uh, yeah, and so, Oops, uh, yeah, uh, so the same is true for countable combinatorics in the reverse math zoo. So combinatorics, uh, yeah, like Ramsey's theorem, like, or, or Koenig's lemma, that stuff, were actually formulated by Ramsey and Koenig in terms of sets, countable sets sometimes even. And so if you interpret countable as the actual meaning of countable, third order, then you get similar results. And so, yeah, so uh, if you think it's safe, if you're gonna hide countable combinatorics, no, 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 no. Third order arithmetic is still coming for you, as it were. All right, so now what's the problem? I mean, so I've been talking a lot. Let's bottom line this, as they say across the pond. What was the problem? I, there are literally hundreds of intuitively weak third order theorems like the uncountability of the reals. And in the usual classification, they are rather strong qua comprehension because yeah, they're not provable in Z2 little omega. They are provable in Z2 big omega, in particular without the axiom of choice. And these things are all, uh, they prove the same second order things. That's a problem because yeah, these things are intuitively weak and they're classified as rather strong. Now, what is the cause? The cause is the following. All these comprehension functionals, Pfeffermann's mu, Kleene's E3, nu n, they're discontinuous or normal. And discontinuous, I literally mean they are discontinuous functions as functions on say bare space. This is all fine and dandy, but these other theorems, the uncountability of the reals, Heine and Borel, and the many items I mentioned, they are non-normal which is means they're consistent with Brouwer's continuity theorem that all functions are continuous. So, and that's the cause of all these problems. These are two fundamentally different categories, the normal, the discontinuous world and the non-normal world. Uh, where, yeah, things are consistent with everything is continuous. So these are two very different things and you shouldn't try to analyze one in terms of the other. Like trying to measure the strength of non-normal theorems, uncountability of the reals, Heine Borel, in terms of discontinuity, a discontinuous comprehension functional, it's a bad idea. It doesn't work. These are two fundamental things and they should be separated. And indeed, that's the solution I propose. Instead of this, this harebrained, overly simplistic idea of a linear girdle hierarchy, Below second order arithmetic, we just split it into, into a normal part where you have comprehension, pi 1k, comprehension, discontinuous functionals. This is Coulombach's higher order reverse math. It is wonderful, but it's not the entire answer. 
This is the normal part. There's also a non-normal part where nothing discontinuous lives. It's, con it's consistent with Brouwer's continuity theorem and the yeah, such theorems as Heine Burel, the uncountability of the reals, Arzela's convergence theorem, they're classified here. So that is my point. Give up this, this, yeah, this, this simplistic idea, a linear hierarchy. No, split it in two. One part where we measure discontinuity and when one part where we measure yeah, something else. Of course, then the question is, this already exists. We use comprehension and discontinuous functionals to measure strength. How do we measure it here? How do we get a hierarchy for the non-normal part? And now we get to my title again, Brouwer. Leutzen Egbertus Jan, the famous Frisian, some say he also lived in Holland, uh, is of course famous for his intuitionistic math. And intuitionistic math is formalized using non-classical continuity axioms. As I mentioned, all functions are continuous. These continuity axioms have a weak counterpart. And the weak and the normal axiom are connected via the classically valid neighborhood function principle. It was introduced in the 70s by Kreisel and Trulstra, another Frisian, Anna Scher Trulstra. And NFP is essentially a um, piece of the yeah, part of the axiom of choice that says there are continuous choice functions. So we have a for all there exists here, but we also have a continuous dependency, like if n means it's just a finite sequence. And then we get a continuous choice function given by a reverse math code or Kleene associate. Of course, this was way before reverse math and coding was a thing. And so, yeah, this, this is NFP. Uh, and this fragments of this, this is how you uh, populate the non-normal part. So all of the, or many of the non-normal theorems I've mentioned, Heine Borel, Lindelöf, monotone convergence theorem for nets, they're equivalent to natural fragments of NFP, allowing for any higher order parameters. So this is essentially, yeah, it says that continuous choice functions exist. And now you understand why this doesn't add anything discontinuous because yeah, it says there's a continuous choice function, right? And so this is all great, whoopee. We have our normal part, Kullenbach's higher order reverse map based on discontinuity, discontinuous comprehension functionals. And we have our non-normal part where we measure by, yeah, continuous choice functions, isn't that wonderful? Uh, yeah, I think it is, and it gets better, yes. Um, the equivalences from one, so as I said, there's lots of equivalences involving fragments of NFP. These equivalences, they map to the big five equivalences under the canonical embedding of higher order arithmetic into second order arithmetic reminiscent of Plato's allegory of the cave, no less. So now it gets really hubristic, actually. So yeah, Plato, um, everybody knows Platonism in math, I hope. The theory that mathematical objects are objective timeless entities independent of the physical world and the symbols that represent them. Uh, a visual illustration was provided by Plato already, the allegory of the cave. Here we have some savages that have been chained up in a dark cave all of their life. They've never seen actual objects. They've never seen, for example, a vase. They only know shadows or reflections of a vase cast by, say, a fiber. Nowadays, we might use a lead light, but the principle is the same. They only know shadows or reflections. And of course, the allegory is very, it's very obvious, it's very thick. This is us. We can only know shadows, reflections of ideal objects. That's, and, and Google actually in an unpublished paper actually uh, said something very similar to this. Now you can take this literally and say, well, if, if Plato is right, if the allegory of the cave is apt, what are the current foundations of math reflections of? And that's the thing I'm trying to tell you, the big five of reverse math and all the equivalences they're just a reflection of a higher order truth, namely fragments of NFP and equivalences under so-called ECF. 
ECF is the canonical embedding of higher order arithmetic into second order arithmetic, going back to Kleene and Kreisel in the 50s. So most of this already existed. I just had to piece it together. I didn't have to make anything up. You know, it was already there, as in Platonism. Right, so uh, here comes a lot. So here we have the big five. As I said, uh, RCA0, ACA0, and PI11. Comprehension are based on comprehension. There's two intermediate systems, and there's lots of equivalences. Uh, yeah, this is well known, right? WKL is equivalent to countable Heine Bodel compactness. A continuous function is Riemann integrable, Denis theorem, and so on, actually. And well, as I said, open sets are countable unions of open balls, and lots of theorems about closed sets are equivalent here. Multiple convergence theorem for sequences, the range of a function exists. Sure, why not? Now, here is a higher order hierarchy with lots of equivalences. And you know, here, for example, we have Denis' theorem for nets indexed by bear space, Heine Borel for uncountable covers. Open sets are now represented as uncountable unions, and closed sets are the complement thereof. Ascoli Arzela for nets, the monotone convergence theorem for nets, always indexed by bare space. The range of a third order object exists. And yeah, ever since one and so forth. And in fact, ECF maps higher order into second order arithmetic. How does it do that? Any uncountable object, any third order object is replaced by a countable representation or a reverse math code as you might do in reverse math, actually. And the same is true for all these equivalences. And that is just beautiful, I think. Like, Denis theorem for nets is equivalent to uncountable Heine Borel. ECF maps to Denis theorem for sequences, uncountable Heine Borel, and so on. Like, this is higher order reverse math about uncountable objects. And if you throw away the uncountable, replace it by countable representations, you get second order arithmetic. And I will have you know that I did not have to make up any of this. Nets have existed for almost 100 years. Uncountable Heine Borel, more, 120 years. The gauge integral, all pretty old too, and so on and so forth. All these things exist. ECF has existed before many of us were born. And the higher order truth maps to the second order truth. I would say that's beautiful. And yeah, I mean, you may disagree with me. In fact, people will probably argue forever what ism is or is not the true foundation or philosophy of math. But you know, we might take a hint from the exact sciences to which actually math technically belongs. And we, instead of arguing which ism is the true one, Let's try to find evidence to support our little theories as they do in the exact sciences. And so I present this previous picture as evidence supporting Platonism. Plato's cave and so on, you know, you have reflections. Well, actually that does exist. It exists in the foundations of math. I just pieced it together. And so here's evidence for Platonism. Come back when you have better evidence for your rivaling theory. So in conclusion, uh, coding in second order arithmetic is not bad per se. It does work for continuous function, but it's a very bad idea once you step into the discontinuous. Um, and this is already the case for basic theorems like the Riemann integral, which is about bounded functions that are continuous almost everywhere. So a little bit of discontinuity and boom, coding fails miserably. So yeah. As we have seen, then you should go to Columbus higher order reverse math, but it's great, but it has some problems. It's a normal scale and some intuitively weak theorems are classified as rather strong, like the uncountability of the reals. And we just introduce a complementary non-normal scale where NFP is the, yeah, measures how much, where your theorem is. And then lo and behold, the big five of reverse math are a reflection of the non-normal scale under Kleene's Kleene Kreisel's ECF. So this is what I wanted to show you today. Coding is bad if you step into the discontinuous. 
Coulomb by higher order reverse math is where you can actually study discontinuity, discontinuous stuff. It has its problems. We can solve that problem by having a normal and a non-normal scale. The non-normal scale is populated by something that comes from Brouwer's intuitionistic math. And you even have this allegory of the cave thing. The big five of reverse math are a reflection of a higher order truth. And most of this stuff already existed and is old 50 or 100 years. So yeah, some final thoughts. My favorite two revolutionaries would say that, well, the higher order revolution is not going to happen by itself. You have to make it happen. Whitehead and yeah, this one I had to include for the uh, mirror. Whitehead has said some nice things too. And of course, yeah, thank you for your attention. Any questions? Okay.